Welcome to this information video on the Early Career Development Program. In this video, we're talking specifically about applications from individual artists and cultural workers who will be applying to the mentorship or residency components. My name is Erin Macklem. I'm a program advisor with responsibility for the performing arts applicants to the Early Career Development Program, and I'm joined by my colleague, Michelle Benjamin, who looks after studio arts. We at the BC Arts Council carry out our work on the land of Indigenous nations throughout what is colonially known as British Columbia, and we're grateful for the continuing relationships with Indigenous people in BC that develop through our work together. We offer gratitude to the Lekwungen people, known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, on whose ancestral lands we operate our main offices, and where Michelle and I are offering this video from today. We also want to acknowledge and thank the First Peoples Cultural Council, who we have partnered with for many years to deliver the Indigenous Arts programs. In this session, we hope to offer some context about who the BC Arts Council is and what we do. We'll outline the BC Arts Council's current strategic plan and funding priorities. We'll focus on the ins and outs of the Early Career Development Program, often shorthanded to ECD, uh, and we'll provide some general tips for grant writing. We also have a second information session recorded that is focused specifically on the application questions. You can find the link to the video on the Early Career Development webpage or on our YouTube page. If you have any questions after reading the program guidelines and reviewing these videos, please reach out to me or Michelle and we'll be happy to provide further information or guidance. Our contact information is on the webpage for the Early Career Development Program and also will be provided at the end of this slideshow. The BC Arts Council is a funding agency for the BC government. We support arts and cultural activity and over 200 communities throughout BC. We are housed within the Ministry of Tourism, Arts, Culture and Sport, and our ministry is led by the Honourable Lana Popham. The BC Arts Council was established by an act of legislation in 1995 for the purposes of providing support for arts and culture in British Columbia, for providing persons and organizations with the opportunity to participate in the arts and culture in BC, and providing an open, accountable, and neutrally administered process for managing funds for British Columbia Arts and Culture. The agency includes a 15-member council, which broadly represents the diverse regions, cultures, and artistic communities of BC. The council's role, role is to oversee the strategic directions of the BC Arts Council. The current council chair is Sehun Stan Chung, and the vice chair is Dana Claxton. Our job is to ensure that individual artists and arts and cultural organizations throughout the province are supported because we understand how important the arts are as an economic driver, as well as to the health and well being of people and communities, and of course, for their own sake. The British Columbia Arts Council funds a wide range of activities, projects, organizations, and individuals. Some examples. We support community arts programming in rural and urban centers. We provide money to individual artists and arts and culture workers and arts and culture practitioners to create new artistic work and to develop their professional skills. And we provide funding opportunities for professional performing arts companies, indigenous artists and cultural organizations, art galleries, local museums, festivals, and community arts organizations. The work we do is guided by our new foundation strategic plan and our extending foundations action plan. The strategic plan prioritizes sustainability and creative development of the sector, increasing equity, diversity, and access throughout all of our programs and processes, support for indigenous arts and culture, and support for regional arts and community arts. The extending foundations action plan places reconciliation, equity, diversity, inclusion, and access at the center of all of our work. These detailed plans are available on our website and we encourage you to read them as they offer valuable insight into the work we do and the programs we offer. You'll see reference to some of these strategic directions in the program guidelines and the application form. In alignment with the Extending Foundations Action Plan, we've integrated equity criteria across all of our funding programs. The BC Arts Council has committed to targeted investment in underserved and equity deserving organizations and the development of equity support initiatives, including a policy to support designated priority groups. 
Support for designated priority groups includes funding prioritization, dedicated programs, and outreach. The BC Arts Council's designated priority groups include applicants and arts and cultural practitioners who are Indigenous, so First Nations, Métis, or Inuit, are deaf or experience disability, are Black or people of colour, are located outside Greater Vancouver or the Capital Region. For clarity, the Capital Region does not include the Gulf Islands or Souk. Uh, Greater Vancouver does not include the Sunshine Coast, Chilliwack, or Abbotsford. For more information on the definitions of uh, outside Greater Vancouver or the Capital Region, please click the link in the guidelines for specifics. To be eligible for the Designated Priority Group Strategic Funding, you must complete the Designated Priority Group's questionnaire as part of your online profile within the online grant system. And we also encourage you to complete the voluntary self-ID form in your profile. You're not obliged to disclose if you are from any of the designated priority groups, but if you feel comfortable, we do encourage you to identify this in your profile and you may receive priority in the final ranking process and allocation of funds. Also in alignment with the Extending Foundations Action Plan, the BC Arts Council now offers two accessibility support programs. Individuals who self-identify as deaf or having a disability are eligible for the accessibility programs, which are application assistance, which pays for support services for creating and submitting grant applications, registering in the online system, and preparing project updates or final reports. This program will allow you to hire someone to help you with the application process. The Access Support Program provides additional funding that supports access costs associated with creating or developing a project funded by a BC Arts Council grant. You can include this with your grant application submission or request access support funding up to 90 days after you find out if your grant application was successful. Some examples of support you can request include ASL interpretation or translation, transcription or editing support or visual assistance, these programs do not provide funding for audience accessibility or day-to-day -day access costs outside of the scope of a project. Accessibility requests are confidential and are not part of the assessment process. To find out more about accessibility support at our website, please visit bcartscouncil.ca slash accessibility. We hope that this first part of our presentation gave you a bit of a sense of who the BC Arts Council is and what our strategic priorities are. Now we'll focus in on the Early Career Development Program. We're about to share a lot of information. Please know that all of this is available in the program guidelines and they can be found on the program webpage on our website. You might want to follow along with those right now if you have them open. So the project assistance for the Early Career Development Program supports immersive and highly impactful opportunities for emerging and early career practitioners to develop their artistic and or administrative practice, to participate in knowledge transfer, skill sharing, and reciprocal learning in the sector, expand their career experience, professional networks and exposure, and professional portfolio, and to build capacity in their identified community or communities these might include their geographic community, cultural community, the area of practice that they work in, et cetera. Later on, we'll discuss exactly what we mean by an early career practitioner, and we'll review the specific eligibility criteria. Assistance is available to arts and culture organizations and to individual practitioners through four components. These are laid out in separate guidelines according to who is applying. So for organizations, components one and two, component one is internships, which support arts and culture organizations to host an early career practitioner in a paid internship. And component two, cohorts, supports eligible organizations to host a group of early career practitioners in paid professional development positions. For individuals, the focus of this video, uh, we're looking at components three and four. Component three is residency, supports early career practitioners to pursue a learning focused residency within an arts and cultural organization. Component four, mentorship, supports early career practitioners to develop sustained one-on-one -on -one learning through a mentorship with an established practitioner working in their field, art form, or discipline. This information session is focused on residency and mentorship. So as you think about this program and eligibility, 
you need to consider two pieces, the eligibility of the early career practitioner, so the eligibility of the person applying, and then the eligibility of the project, the specific project or activities that are being applied for or what can be funded. And we'll discuss each of these in more detail. First, we'll talk about how we define an early career practitioner. So an early career practitioner must be working in one or more of the arts disciplines funded by the BC Arts Council. And this full list is included in the program guidelines. They must be a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident who ordinarily resides in BC and who has lived in the province for at least 12 months immediately prior to the application being submitted. For more information, please review the Determining BC Residency page on our website, also linked from the guidelines. You must not be enrolled in full-time studies. If you're still a full-time student, you can look to the scholarship program for support with your studies. And you must have submitted all required final reports on previous BC Arts Council grants as of the deadline for the program. Note that applicants will be eligible if your basic training will be completed within six months of the application deadline and before your proposed activity begins. So for example, if you graduate on December 15th, that's five and a half months from the deadline, and your project starts the following February, then you would be eligible. If you graduate on January 15th and your program starts December 1st, then you would not be eligible. And if you have any questions about this, if you're still in school or completing your basic training, just reach out to Michelle or I. Also, for eligibility of the early career practitioner, you need to have completed your basic training in your discipline within five years of the application deadline, or you need to have completed your basic training in your discipline within 10 years of the application deadline and be a member of one of the BC Arts Council's designated priority groups, as we outlined earlier. And what do we mean by basic training? So basic training is considered the appropriate and relevant education in a specific field of practice that's prepared an early career practitioner to work at a professional level. For example, this could be traditional knowledge transfer. It could be apprenticeship with a qualified peer recognized practitioner. It could be a degree or a certificate program from an academic institution. We appreciate that there are many paths to becoming a professional artist. When considering your basic training in relationship to the Early Career Development Program, bear in mind that this program is not intended to support your basic training. It is intended to launch you beyond your basic training. So this is true for folks who may already be a professional artist in one discipline or practice, but who want to transition or pivot into a new practice. This program will not support your basic training in a new area of practice. So now that we've talked about the eligibility of the early career practitioners or the applicants, I'll speak to the eligibility of activities. So projects may offer a mix of learning and creation. However, as learning and knowledge transfer are the priorities of this program, the creation of new work must not be the sole or primary objective. All projects must include specific learning opportunities and objectives, as well as tangible measures, and they must compensate arts and cultural practitioners fairly in keeping with community context and industry, industry standards. In addition, an eligible residency project must provide significant immersive opportunities for skill sharing or knowledge exchange at an established arts and, and or cultural organization. An eligible eligible mentorship project must provide a one-on-one -on -one structured relationship with an established and qualified professional who will share skills and knowledge. It's possible to have more than one mentor or to identify a main mentor and other sources of expertise. However, the program does not support a series of unrelated mentorship activities. Applicants must clearly describe how different mentors will contribute to a cohesive project. Collaborative applications are eligible if all participating applicants meet the eligibility criteria. One individual artist must make the application on behalf of the collective or the partnership. We also ask that anyone applying with a collaboration contact me or Aaron uh, for information before you apply. Virtual residencies and mentorships are also eligible as long as the other criteria are met. And the activity can happen anywhere in the world. The mentor can be uh, from BC 
uh, or anywhere in Canada or anywhere in the world. It's not restricted. Now we'll talk about uh, expenses in this program. So the maximum request is $30,000. You can request uh, support for up to 100% of the project budget. You do not need to have matching funds or other financial contributions. And you do not have to request $30,000. We encourage you to ask for what you need to complete the project effectively. So we'll talk about what the eligible expenses are. The first is subsistence. And this is really the priority of this program. This means uh, uh, basic living costs, uh, your housing costs, whether that's a uh, rent or, or mortgage, and uh, your, your uh, basic food costs and local transportation. Other areas uh, of eligible expenses are travel uh, or, or expenses related to travel, such as accommodation. Uh, fees to a mentor are eligible, as well as fees for, uh, for residency. Any consumable materials and supplies are eligible. So things that you need, uh, supplies that you might need uh, in, the, in the process of your learning practices. And then other directly related fees and expenses are eligible. There are a number of things that will not be funded through this program, and we encourage you to see the program guidelines for a detailed list of those things. We'll talk a little bit about timing and schedules. So a project must be a minimum of eight weeks, and it can be a maximum of one year. The project can begin any time after the application deadline, although if it's uh, before you find out if your application was successful, then you are, are taking the risk of, of the program not being funded. Uh, you will not receive notification of the success of your application until late fall, uh, probably November. So now here's a few tips to help you prepare to um, this or really any uh, program at the BC Arts Council. Be aware that all applications are submitted through our online grant application system. If you are a returning applicant, if you've applied in the past and you're already registered in the system, please make sure that your information, including your current email, your phone number and your mailing address, make sure those are all up to date before starting an application. If you have more than one profile in the system, for example, if you also have a profile that's attached to an organization, make sure that you're using your own personal profile to write your grant application. If you're a new applicant and do not yet have an individual profile in the online grant management system, you'll need to register and create a profile. Please don't leave this until the last minute because once your registration request is submitted, it can take up to five business days for it to be processed on our side of things. And you can't start your online application until your registration has been processed. New registrants will be notified by email once the processing is complete and then you're able to go in and access grant applications. So add the email address no reply at bcartscouncil.ca to your contacts or to your safe senders list and be sure to check your junk mail or spam folder to be sure that you see the confirmation email. For both new and returning applicants, please be sure to complete the designated priority groups tab. Before you begin your application, read the application guidelines and the application preview document. And then we encourage you to discuss your application with the program advisor, so Michelle or me, before jumping in. We're here to help determine if you and your project are eligible for this program and to save you a lot of work and disappointment if you're not. Note that we're not able to pre-read applications and we can't guarantee that your project will be successful, but we can offer advice and answer questions to help set you up for success. Remember that the volume of calls and emails that we receive increases as we get closer to the deadline day, so don't wait until the last minute to reach out. In terms of application requirements, in the application, you will be asked to provide the following. A detailed work plan, including a schedule or timeline appropriate to your learning opportunities and your projected outcomes. Describe the activities that you'll be engaging with, uh, with whom and when. You'll be asked to provide an expense form that will only include expenses for which you're requesting support. We encourage you to use the notes section in this budget form. It's very helpful to the assessors when they're looking through your budget to see how your numbers um, align with what you're using those, those funds for. Uh, you're asked to provide a statement indicating where, when, and with whom your basic training occurred. 
a statement describing up to three relevant highlights from your career and training, with a statement about each highlight's relevance to this project that you're applying for, and then a biographical statement that describes your current practice, uh, your artistic learning and or career development goals, uh, we'll ask you to describe how this opportunity will have an impact on your artistic and or professional practice. Um, explain why this is the right time for you to be engaging in this learning activity. And talk about the artistic, cultural, geographic or other communities that you engage with and how will this project have an impact on those communities as well as yourself. You can submit this biographical statement in one of two formats, but not both. You can submit it as a text document, so upload a text document into the application form, or you can upload it as an audio or audiovisual file. And there's more information about each of those in the guidelines. Additionally, applicants to both residency and mentorship components require uh, two signed letters of reference from established professionals in your discipline or field of practice. Ideally, these letters will be from people who are familiar with your training, your work and practice, and your long-term career aspirations. And then applications for residency must also include a description of the organization hosting the residency, uh, including the names of instructors or mentors within the residency program, and a letter or other document from the host organization confirming your participation. The applications to the mentorship component must include the rationale for why you've selected this particular mentor, uh, the alignment of the mentor's expertise and experience with your learning goals, uh, a one-page letter from the mentor confirming their participation, their qualifications and capacity to mentor you, uh, their ability to provide a physically and culturally safe work environment, and confirmation um, that they've agreed to the rate of pay that you've discussed, and then a statement about the potential impact on this project on you, uh, on them, the mentor, and on your community of practice. And then lastly, a resume or CV from the mentor. The most important words to read and absorb from the program guidelines once you've determined your eligibility is the assessment criteria. This is the lens through which the assessors are reading your applications and making their scoring decisions on your project. You want to be sure that with every question you are answering in the application, you're thinking about the assessment criteria. Pay attention to each aspect of the assessment criteria, including the weighted scoring. This indicates the relative value and importance of each area uh, of criteria. The questions in the application are organized into sections aligned with the assessment criteria. The first is impact on the applicant, weighted at 50%. Here we want to know how is this project going to change your life, transform your practice, and have a significant impact on your career. The second area of assessment is impact on the community and the arts sector, weighted at 30% of the overall scoring. So how will this project have a positive impact on your community of practice or your home community or your cultural community? What kind of extended or reciprocal learning can happen? And the final area of uh, assessment is feasibility, weighted at 20%. So is it actually possible for you to complete this project as described? Do you and your proposed mentor have the capacity to undertake this project? Is the work plan reasonable and is the budget sensible? We go into more detail about the assessment criteria and the associated application questions in the video about the ECD application. We'll talk a bit about how applications are assessed. A merit-based independent peer assessment is the primary method of evaluation for all applications to this program and to most programs at the BC Arts Council. The assessment panel will be made up of individuals from different fields of practice with broad professional knowledge, experience, geographic representation, diverse cultural perspectives, including Indigenous viewpoints. Not every assessor will be familiar with your area of practice. Keep this in mind as you write your application. Assessment panels change from intake to intake. So if you've applied before, it's very likely that a different group will be assessing your application this time. Be sure to uh, understand the process. The assessors read all of the applications, every, one, every eligible application that is submitted. 
they score them, and then they meet together and discuss each application. Finally, they rank them based on merit and against the assessment criteria. Once you have submitted your application, the BC Arts Council will receive all of the online application and, and we review each one for eligibility. Then the assessment panel will evaluate the applications using the assessment criteria outlined previously, and they'll determine the level of funding and any conditions on payment of awards. The BC Arts Council will inform each applicant of the assessment panel's decision in writing, and you are encouraged to contact program staff, uh, me or Aaron, for feedback after the results have been released. For the majority of our programs, BC Arts Council staff do not decide who receives the funding. This is all done through the peer assessment process. If you're interested in becoming a peer assessor, we encourage you to sign up in our online system. So we try to inform each applicant of the results of their application no later than 16 weeks after the submission deadline. Notification will be sent to the email address registered within your profile. Results cannot be requested in advance, but we do encourage you to contact us once you received your response for feedback on the assessment of your application. We hope this overview of the Early Career Development Program has been helpful. And we want to wrap up this video by offering a few tips for setting yourself up for success when approaching a grant application. So you've navigated your way through the online system and you started your application. Now what? Writing a grant is like telling your story. You want to address the key questions that will best communicate your goals and intentions. It's important for you to think about these elements as you prepare to complete your application. Thinking about these questions in advance will help you organize your thoughts and will also inform some of the other elements of an application like your budget and the required support material. Be sure you're addressing the who, what, when, where, why, and how of your project. Some of these are pretty straightforward and some require quite a bit of thought. So what is your project? What are you hoping to achieve? How will you make it happen? What is the work plan? Who is involved with your project? And who will benefit from your project? Where will the project happen? When is it happening? When will it finish? Why will this have an impact on your career and your practice? Why do you do this work? Why is it important? And this why is often the key question for you to address. This should align with the program intentions and speak directly to the assessment criteria. Why are you doing this project? Why is it important? Why is it important right now at this moment in time? And what will be the impact on you and your practice and the larger community? The answers to why often provide the compelling information that engages the assessors and brings your project to life in their imagination and makes assessors feel excited about your project. So here's some uh, quick application tips and a bit of a review. If you're not already registered in our online system, please do this right away. Be sure to read and follow the guidelines and keep the assessment criteria in mind as you go. We encourage you to draft the application early and put it aside. Come back to review it with fresh eyes. Make sure you're answering the questions being asked in the application. It's surprising how often folks lose sight of this as they make their way through an application. Remember that for this program, not every assessor will have experience or ex expertise in your area of practice. So keep that audience in mind as you answer the application questions and choose your language accordingly. Remember that Aaron and I are program advisors. We are not assessors. We don't assess your application. So while you may have explained something to us in an email or over the phone, the assessors rely only on your application. You should articulate your rationale and reasoning clearly in your application, regardless if you have discussed it previously with us. We encourage you to have someone who doesn't know anything about your project read through your application. Do they understand what you are doing and why you're doing it? Can they explain the project back to you? In general, point form or short, short paragraphs are totally fine in your application. You should only include support material that is requested or relevant, and please call us with questions. 
Thank you for your interest in the Early Career Development Program. We hope you'll reach out to us with any questions, and you can follow our social media channels on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date on this and all of our programs. As we've mentioned, Michelle and I co-manage the Early Career Development Program with responsibilities for specific areas. So I um, handle inquiries from the performing arts side of things, theater, dance, and music, and Michelle for the studio arts, media arts, visual arts, literary arts, and museums. We look forward to hearing from you with your questions and thanks for watching.